Welcome. Thanks for stopping by. You're just in time to hear the Bird Ensemble's program, New World Polyphony. Let me tell you about it. The Catholic Church was the driving force behind Spain's conquest of the Americas. The indigenous population was to be evangelized and converted through missionaries, and music was a huge part of the Spanish religious practice at this time. Teaching music was apparently an effective evangelical tool, more so than preaching. Teaching music attracted followers from distant regions. Once their hold was settled in Mexico, Spain set out to build up this new world to resemble the old as much as possible. A great period of expansion and construction began. Between 1521 and 1810, about 12,000 churches were built in Mexico. The zenith of Spanish church music, with the greats like Victoria, Guerrero, Morales, and of course, the Catholic Church's superstar, Palestrina, coincided with this period of expansion. The influence of these old world titans is ever present in the composers who emerged in New Spain over the 16th and 17th centuries. The program this evening begins with an exploration of pieces by old world Renaissance icons and will end with New World selections from the two Mexico City choir books of 1717. Let me show you to your seat. Here at Trinity Parish Church in Seattle, this is the best seat in the house. Please. When I think about COVID and its impact on art and the musical experience, I keep coming back to a central theme, and that theme is attention. With choirs off the stage, we've had to find new ways to share our music. At the beginning of COVID, many groups produced virtual choir videos. You know the ones, those Brady Bunch videos with all the singers in the grid. We've had to keep finding creative ways to capture the attention of music listeners through this format. And now we are producing what are more like music videos. We are constantly reminded through this format that it's not a live performance. If there's one thing I've learned during the pandemic, it's that I want to put my attention back to the things that matter. And in this spirit, we have put a lot of time and energy playing with camera tricks and utilizing all the audio recording technology possible to bring us all back to a familiar place, the stage.
The first piece you heard was by Counter-Reformation composer Palestrina, perhaps the most famous Renaissance composer, no doubt due to his prolific output. He composed over a hundred masses, 140 madrigals, and more than 300 motets, and that's not all of it. Musically, his harmonic style was old school and remained remarkably consistent throughout his career. He kept his writing mostly stepwise motion and dare not put a dissonance on a strong beat. Any dissonance would be resolved immediately. I call him the traditionalist. He gets kind of a bad rap for his samey or dispassionate music, but that could be because he had to produce so much of it. I get it. If you have a formula that works, stick with it. Bach did. Palestrina's influence on the development of sacred music was far and wide, eventually reaching Spanish composer Tomas Luis de Victoria, who may have studied with Palestrina in Rome in 1565. Victoria, dubbed the Spanish Palestrina, wrote the next piece on the program, Ave Regina Celerum, which means Hail, O Queen of Heaven. Unlike Palestrina's piece, which is mostly polyphonic in texture, Victoria's Marian Motet works in some nice drama with the use of the double choir. It's worth noting that Counter-Reformation composers including Palestrina and Victoria, could not write too virtuosic of music, as it could obscure the meaning of the text. Victoria, I think, strikes a good balance. I think it's easy to forget that this music is based on chant. Let me sing some for you. Here's a Marian anaphon, Ave Regina Celerum. But first, lights.
when you see specific singers or parts featured, they often are singing something interesting. And my shot selection is really me trying to shine a flashlight at those interesting musical moments. Second famous to Victoria was Spanish composer Alonso Lobo. Lobo's music was influential far beyond Spain and into Mexico. Lobo's Versa Est in Luctum is his most famous work. It was written for the funeral of Philip II in 1598 at Toledo Cathedral. It is written beautifully to this dark text. My harp is turned to grieving and my flute to the voice of those who weep. Spare me, O Lord, for my days are as nothing.
This upcoming set of pieces are from the two Mexico City choir books of 1717. First up is a setting of the Lamentations of Jeremiah, a lament on the destruction of Jerusalem by Antonio Rodriguez Mata. Mata served as the chapel master of the Cathedral of Mexico City sometime after 1614 until his death in 1643. During Mata's tenure, the musical establishment grew in quality and reputation, and by the 1620s, its excellence was known throughout the Spanish Empire. His compositions display a dark, sober style, nurtured in the Spanish tradition of Victoria.
another chapel master of the Cathedral of Mexico City until 1738, Manuel de Sumaya was perhaps the most famous Mexican composer of the colonial period of New Spain. Sumaya was pivotal in the introduction of the Baroque style to the music of Mexico. We hear a hint of the forward-looking Baroque harmony in this penitential setting of Psalm 78. Antonio de Salazar became the chapel master at the Cathedral of Mexico City soon after Mata retired. He's noted for a strict contrapuntal style harking back to Palestrina and represents the last of the truly conservative Hispanic composers before the all-conquering Italian style took Spain and its empire by storm. This next motet utilizes classical Italian polychoral techniques in this celebratory communion motet for double choir.
Thanks for tuning in to this broadcast tonight. Hope you enjoyed the music. We've prepared one more piece for you. This one is quite different from the other pieces you've heard tonight. British choral music saw a revival of Renaissance styles in the early 20th century. There was a rebirth of music written in the same Renaissance vein, but with modern harmony. None better to showcase this lush style than William Harris's Fair is the Heaven. It is set to a poem by Edmund Spencer. This piece is very personal to me. It was this piece that was my gateway into choral music. I remember hearing it for the first time in high school, knowing after that one listen that I would spend my life making choral music. I find the text particularly poignant in these times, the idea of heaven as a perfection that we mortals aspire to, that there is such a beauty worth pursuing. For me, a glimmer of hope in a time of darkness. How then can mortal tongue hope to express the image of such endless perfectness? Which are turned.